All right, so great to have Whiff Brud with us today. Um, I first met Whiff when I was in ninth or 10th grade when the Dallas Brass came through my hometown of Russellville, Arkansas. Dallas Brass was doing this community outreach situation where they would invite students up on stage and I happened to be one of them. I ended up, um, you know, I was terrified of course, uh, but Whiff was so, so welcoming. But at that rehearsal, I remember this one one thing in particular, and it, Whiff was warming up a little bit, playing this pedal C that sounded like a bass trombonist, right? And those of you that have heard Whiff warm up, you know what I'm talking about. You can't get that out of your ear. And certainly, um, I had no idea that a trumpet could do that. And then later, I'd go on to study trumpet with Whiff, of course, at the University of Arkansas, and where he played just a huge role in my development, both my confidence and sort of equipping me with the skills that I need for a career in music and and uh, just uh, and continues to be that for me and, and all of his students, as, as many of you know, um, how much he invests in his students. But watching him go about his business um, as a student, too, was an education of itself. So uh, thanks so much, Whiff, for joining us. Um, and uh, Whiff, we know, is the, the trumpet professor, longtime trumpet professor at Baylor University. Um, where he has just an absolutely incredible trumpet studio, author of two amazing books that we'll get to in a little bit. And thanks again, Wef. Appreciate it. Oh, it's great to be with you, Chris. And, you know, as your former teacher and now your colleague of many years, it's just, it's, it's fun seeing all the wonderfully uh, productive work you're doing and you're helping so many. You've helped so many of my students. And uh, I just, it's just great. It's, it's like a family reunion today. So anyway, thanks for doing this. This is nice. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Whiff. Let's get into it. Um, sure. So your time as an educator is well documented. You started your career at Oklahoma Baptist. Uh, a number of years later, you went into full-time performing with Dallas Brass and later Rhythm and Brass. Ob obviously, you're still an active performer today. Over the course of your career as a performer, how has your outlook changed in more recent years as it relates to performing? In other words, do you do you still get that itch with to perform? Yes. Oh, I sure do. And I, you know, my my dream uh, and some of my dreams, I always say, didn't come true. You know, they were actually surpassed, which is I'm so grateful for that. You know, sometimes when we're younger, it's like, what do you want to do? And sometimes we're very specific. And uh, I remember a student auditioning at Baylor years ago. You know, because the typical answer we all give when we're younger is, I want to be the principal trumpet of a major symphony orchestra. I've even had students say of this particular orchestra, it's like, oh, well, let me, I better call Mike Sachs and tell him that we found his replacement. But I remember um, a young lady saying, when I asked the question, what do you want to do? Uh, she said, I, I hope to have a meaningful career in music, hopefully including the trumpet. And I thought that, I think that's a really healthy approach. And I, I remember feeling that way when I was a, a music student. And, uh, you know, I was a music ed major, as you were, and but then got a master's in performance. But I wanted to be prepared for anything that music might bring, and I really had no idea what that meant. But, yes, I still get a charge, and it's, um, I just, I, my wife will tell you, when I don't have the chance to perform for a while, I get a little, I get a little antsy. And then when I do get the chance, even on the way, you know, I usually have to drive a bit. Um, on the way, I'm still that, and I wonder if I am cut out to do this, you know, the imposter syndrome that so many of us suffer from. But I still do. My, I think my perspective has changed because when you're younger in the business and when parts of your dream uh, start coming true and then you start dreaming bigger dreams, and mine was to be a performer and a teacher, and here I am uh, living that out, and I'm so grateful for that. I think what happens as we get older is now I'm, you know, if I'm playing Mahler's Second Symphony with an orchestra, and for years that eluded me, and now I've had maybe five or six, you know, series of that. But when's the last time I'm going to get to do that, you know? And and I start I started looking at opportunities a little more differently, and I think also with teaching. You know, when I started at Baylor 20 years ago, the students I'm teaching now were just being born. But I think that all my students have been born now. I haven't met them all, but you know what I'm saying? Life changes, and I think the older we get, the more um, special all this becomes. So I tend to treasure the opportunities more and more, you know, that people actually still let me play 
you know, in public. And uh, <laughs> I have a few friends that will tell me when it's time to, to stop. But every time I get to play something, it's I, I get excited. There's I still get that. Uh, in the early days, it was the phone ringing, you know, and, and then getting an answering machine, and now it's a text or an email. But there's something just wonderful about the opportunity to perform. And I think as a teacher, I, I know as a teacher, every time I get to play with other great musicians, I have new things to say, new observations to make, or I'll be listening to them with different ears. You know, when you've been in this business a long time, there are things that change, you know, concepts and, and musical taste. And there's nothing like um, sitting in the middle of some of the greatest music surrounded by great players to really get a feel for what you have to, or finding new things that you want to share with your students. So, yes. But I think part of the charge is because what am I going to learn that I can teach? Not just play the music for myself, but what can I take home to my students? Well, great stuff. So you're always thinking in terms of teaching in your performing, which I think is an awesome way to go about that because both of those inform each other, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, what a blessing to be able to have experiences so it's not a theory or it's not just an idea, but it's something that you know, you're actually doing your research, you know, as you go. Very good. Yeah. Good stuff. You know, I once heard you in a master class. It must have been an NTC master class or, and it was in the context of a, of a warm up class, I, I believe. And, you know, you, you just mentioned it sort of in passing and it, and it really struck me. You said we're, we're earning our way to the music. Um, and I, I've sort of been, you know, and I, I'm using that in my teaching as well, you know, when we're talking about fundamentals and, and how to build up correctly and, and take care of yourself and, and start over every day, you know, and that's, uh, that's an interesting point. And I, I want you to ex maybe expand on that a little bit and what that means, not only to, you know, your infamous warm up sessions at, at, at Baylor, but also in your own personal practice. Sure. Yeah. It, it, it struck me, I guess, the more I, um, got involved in, in deep teaching and trying to, you know, uh, in my own playing, just realizing how critical the fundamentals were, you know, and never for them to be a crutch, but to feel like, you, you know, we always have to, many of us need to start every day as like the, a, a well-informed beginner, start fresh and kind of relearn in a fresher and more efficient way how to actually play the instrument. But I think, you know, especially moving back to Texas, and I'm I'm a product of the Texas system and, you know, all state, the whole region A2 thing here, just like a lot of states, it's a big deal. And um, I I think it struck me when I was asked early on in my time back at Baylor to come do some all region A2 clinics. And one, one particular young man was playing for me and I, it was out of the selected studies. I'm pretty sure the name of the etude was A major, <laughs> a really creative title. And so he's playing and I said, so what key is this piece in? And he couldn't answer me. And the title's like right there, but it's <laughs> a little busy when you get the title. I said, uh, so we explored that. I said, well, what are, could you pick a scale that would fit with this, that kind of thing? And it would, it just was a lesson right away that so many students are so anxious to learn these etudes or to learn the music that they, maybe they haven't been taught or they've forgotten that we have to earn the right to play this music. So I said, well, what's the title of this piece? And he looked at me and A major and he kind of went, oh, okay. <laughs> And, you know, A major is not the easiest key on the trumpet anyway. It's awkward, especially down low. And uh, so we that's that kind of launched a lot of new thinking. And I think that a lot of the educators in the state um, understand, and I've said it, that I'm not the person to call to come teach etudes because what will happen is some young student will start to play and I'll pause and say, why don't we work on your sound? Why don't we work on some rhythmic things? Why don't we work on the keys, the scales that are necessary to play this thing. And we've all seen, you know, like right lately on social media, the, the the iceberg has been showing up again lately. You know, it's like all the stuff that's underwater, you know, in the performance. 
the etude, the solo is what the audience sees, and that's the goal. But it it is it's a good analogy because it's all that work that nobody sees or even salutes, you know, that that comes into this. So I think that um, you know it's um, I'm going to slaughter his name, but. Mary Franken or Franken, she's the gentleman that the uh, the UNESCO legend was written for. So we're talking well over a hundred years ago. And um, Ben Hauser, one of my former students, alerted me to the fact a few years ago that Q Press had published this, but with the English translation, which I had never, I had never read what you know he had to Mary Franken had to say about practicing. But his method was actually Maurice Andre's preferred method. And in, in the front of this book, he, he says, uh, if you want to practice two hours a day, um, well, I've got it here. Um, you should do 20 minutes of producing s- soft sounds. Okay. Uh, and then five minutes of loud sounds and then rest for 10 minutes. And later on, he goes to say, during those sessions, you should be resting quite a bit. Trumpet players are not good at this. And then after the rest, sustain notes for 15 minutes. That means just long tones? Well, it probably means something like moving long tones like Clark or slow melodies. And then rest for 15 minutes. And then do various exercises, so probably intervals, flexibility, 20 minutes, 15 minutes of rest. And then at the end, and this is for two hours of practice a day, which includes rest, studies, melodies, or excerpts, 20 minutes. So out of 120 minutes, over 100 years ago, one of the greatest teachers and players of the time was saying, spend most of your time on the th- building the toolbox and then take it to the music. And I, you know, I call it, uh, tripods are great, right? You know, I like the warm up, step one, tone bath, whatever you want to call it. No extended techniques, just find yourself, you know, Rafa Mendes called it a tone bath every day. Find your sound. I think that's awesome. And then the, your building sessions, your technique, all the stuff that you need to do. Tone, technique, and then the musical stuff. So I think that's a good example of earning your way. It's like go through these steps. It's so, so important. And in the same book, he has, what do you do for three hours? What do you do for four hours? Uh, and when you get to a certain amount of time, he starts talking about morning, afternoon, and evening sessions. And there's so much wisdom in that kind of thing. And I think particularly now people are in such a hurry and there's so many uh, distractions. You know, we keep that phone on and there's so, it's so easy to, uh, to get out of alignment because of all the distractions. And I think this old school thinking has so much, so much wisdom in it. And if you read the rest of his book, it's, um, it's just pretty clear that I think we're back in a time of getting the trumpet to be a resonator, beautiful sounds, and I have a feeling that's exactly what was going on a hundred years ago in in trumpet playing. Wow, that, that's an amazing insight. I had no idea that that, that was uh, even a thing. It, uh, obviously, you see his his name on the UNESCO. It was definitely yeah. dedica- dedicated to him, I believe. He was yeah. a monster. He was a monster. Wow. And a a couple of other thoughts, if if we have time, Um, you know, I also had a colleague that clarified this for me when I started doing more work as, you know, an adjudicator or evaluating. And he quoted what is attributed to St. Francis of of Assisi. And I use this a lot in discussion, but no, the idea is that the step one is to be a laborer. And that's where we, we work with our hands, right? And in much of the world, anybody is lucky to have a job where they can labor and and have enough to provide shelter and food and basic necessities. Most of us live a fairly privileged life, that kind of thing. But musically speaking, what is a laborer? Well, when we work with our hands, we are learning notes and rhythms of A major, the etude and A major. We're learning the scales. We're learning the intervals. We're, We're studying. We're getting the toolbox. And then he went on to say, um, that the next step is where you put your mind into it. And this is the crafting part. This is where it's, how am I going to phrase this? Where am I going to breathe? I'm going to mark these things. Who should I listen to? I like this. I don't like that. Uh, you know, really exploring the music. Um, and then the third phase would be where we have hands, mind, and heart. 
and this is the artist the artist level. So I think when I walk in a band room in Texas and somebody knows there's going to be a clinic, they they run in, they grab the horns out of the case, and they start playing the etudes. And it's like, let's regroup, let's back up, and let's find our way to artistry. And I think all those all three steps are so important. And uh, we all know who the great artists are, those that play with incredible heart, and that's our what we pursue. And most, most of us will be very happy and satisfied if we, if we can come away from most of the work that we do, being really good craftspersons, that we've really crafted the music beautifully. And then we have those special moments where things just line up and there is true artistry involved. It's a journey to get there. I, you know, I think of Beverly Sills, what an amazing singer she was. And she was quoted as saying that uh, five times in her career, which was an amazing career. And she was known as Bubbles. She was so, such an uplifted and uplifting person. She said, five times in my career, I sang the way I wanted to. And the rest of the time, I just did my best. Well, her best was so amazing, but I think we all need to do that. We just do our best, do our best. And then we have those wonderful, wonderful moments that are kind of lighthouse memories for us, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that insight. I want, I want to keep it there actually for a second because that leads me kind of to my next question. Um, so you've been performing for a long time. In fact, I would say, you know, at the beginning of your career, you were more a performer than, than, than you are a teacher. And we all have those ebbs and flows to our career. Um, but you've been at this a long time. And I think, um, you know, a, a lot of people don't remember with Rudd in the Dallas Brass days or new trumpet players or, or rhythm and brass. And by the way, I was at the very first rhythm and brass concert in Chicago. <laughs> I mean, my senior year of high school. I, I think awesome. I've That's right. That before. And yeah. I remember that because we landed and, and we were supposed to play the next day. And they said, there's been a change and you guys are playing tonight. Yeah, and you were there P playing in an otter band yeah yeah it was it was pretty cool to see that but you know those rhythm and brass days in particular i mean it was my favorite brass group you know um for, for and it was a lot of people's favorite brass group it was just um it was different it was you know you guys were innovative and and you guys all had had, had your skill set sets that that were a little bit different but complimentary you brought rex richardson into the group you know, those albums, you know, were just phenomenal. And so, you know, your record as a performer is out there and you've had a, you've been doing this a long time, like I said, and you, you know, as you reflect back and, you know, we're talking about, you know, these few performances that you remember in particular, um, and there's not many of them, you know, there's, there's a few that just sort of stick with you. And do you want to maybe share with us a couple of those from, from your performing days? That'd be great. Absolutely. I think uh, one of the first, I'll, this could be a shoe shine because, oh my goodness, um, it's been it's been a wonderful ride and a surprise too because um, as a, I've, I've kind of shifted slightly, but as a young introvert full of doubts, but wanting this to work out, you know, I've really been blessed with some amazing memories. I would say the first big lighthouse moment for me was when I was in the San Antonio Youth Symphony. And I write this about this in, in one of my books because I owe so much to Anthony Plogue. In fact, we just had coffee talk this morning. He's in Germany and and there are four or five of us that get together once a month for chat and it's always so uplifting. And Tony knows how to tell a great joke. But uh so I didn't I didn't know what a side by side was, but you know, we got to sit next to the members of the San Antonio Symphony and play a con some concerts for, for young people. And uh Tony was young, that was his first job, and he was from California, and I'd heard about him, but when he took a breath and played, I had never heard such a beautiful sound in all my life. I mean, if you don't know Tony's playing, then get one of the two recordings of Persichetti's Hollow Men. Uh, it's just, that's what I was sitting next to. Just imagine, as great as it sounds on the recordings, what that would be like for a 17-year-old to like, I mean, the sound was just hugging all of us. And Tony and I became good friends later, uh, later. And I would say it was the next year. Um, my teacher said, there's this thing that American Airlines sponsors. It's called the AYP, American Youth Performs. 
and American Airlines sponsored a symphony orchestra and a choir. And for the orchestra, they chose two music students from high school students from each state. And I didn't know what I was doing. I got my dad's reel to reel tape recorder because that's how you did it. And I remember you had to introduce yourself on your recording. And I would say, hi, I'm, and I'm sure in my Texas draw, I'm Whiff Rudd from San Antonio, play the trumpet. And in the background, my beagle is howling like crazy. And we did so many takes and finally just gave up. So I'm sure they just felt so sorry for this kid. But Carl Sievers was in that group. That's when Carl and I met. So that's 50 years ago this coming May that that happened. Mm -hmm. And for two weeks, we played Firebird and Festive Overture and Rock Modern Off the Bells and another piece. And I played uh, Del Joyo Song of the Open Road um, with the choir. And we played in the Kennedy Center and we played in Carnegie Hall. And that was a special day because um, it's Carnegie Hall. And I remember there was a young man rising up at that same time and his name was on a banner hanging from Carnegie Hall and it said, Yo, Yo Ma. <laughs> and so the special part about that day and that performance was that these other, you know, a Bach trumpet was what everybody wanted back then. And I had a con C trumpet and there weren't too many Bach tr C trumpets available in Texas. So I looked up, uh, I, I'd saved my money and I'm in New York City. I'm going to go buy a C trumpet. So I ended up in Giardinelli's and I didn't know anything about Robert Giardinelli or that he was famous or anything about the store. And I walked in and said, do you have any C trumpets? And he spent two hours with me in the C trumpet room. And I got mouthpieces, a mute, my first gig bag, and a new C trumpet and went to the sound check in Carnegie Hall straight from there. And I remember Carl saying, are you going to play that tonight? And I went, yeah, I'm like you guys. I, I'm thinking I, I've got my box C trumpet now. And it went great. The solo went great. I had the time of my life. Side story. I went home. My teacher was wonderful, but he played light equipment. And it was his con C trumpet that he had given me. And I said, look, look what I got in New York. And, uh, and he, he backed up and he said, oh, those are hard to play. I believed him. <laughs> I just soloed on it in Carnegie Hall and played all that rep on it and had the time of my life. And it took me, I think, another year to figure out how to play that seat trumpet. But that was a lighthouse moment just because that gave me serious hope as I was entering my college years. And then after that, oh my goodness, there are just so many wonderful events. I think uh, another was in Carnegie Hall when I had the opportunity to play with the University of Arkansas Wind Ensemble. And five or six nights group for that. That was just, and you know, when Dale Warren came to my office right before Rhythm and Brass headed to Saudi Arabia, he said, Phil Smith had to back out. Would you be willing to play a piece in Carnegie Hall? I was like, yeah, I'd love to play a piece in Carnegie Hall. And it's now one of my favorite pieces, but it scared the living daylights out of me when I opened it on the flight overseas and it was, you know, Turn Chronicles. Uh, but that was a special performance with students you know, that I was working so diligently with and loving and to be back in Carnegie Hall and then to play and like, I don't think a decent musician can play badly in Carnegie Hall. There's something about Carnegie Hall, the, the room becomes your instrument. And while you, I'm playing, there's Joe Turin. But it was so awesome, you know, to have that kind of experience. And lately, the most meaningful experiences have been... Um, with my students because some of them are, are playing uh, professionally, you know, on the side, even as undergrads and at Wago Symphony, uh, we get to use our students as extra musicians. And it reminds me of me sitting next to my teachers when I was in school playing at the orchestra with them and times with Tony. So I think that's, those are the ones I'm really enjoying now is getting to play great music with one of my students right next to me. It's really fun. That's awesome. Do you have Do you have one rhythm and brass story? Oh, God. oh well, yeah. Let's see. Let's think more like it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, you know that that concert you were talking about was super meaningful and scary because we were still getting our legs, and I think that the most the early most meaningful moment was there was a time we weren't sure we we're going to start a group. You know, four of us had left the other group, and we. People said you should start a new group. 
And I went to the trumpet conference in Akron. So this was in 93. And I saw my teacher, Mike Ewald, who was, had been such an encourager. And, and wow, he passed away way too soon. Uh, we wouldn't be talking if Mike had not been in my life. And uh, I told him, you know, that there'd been big changes and I wasn't sure what to do. I was even thinking about getting out of music. And Mike was hosting ITG at uh, University of Illinois in 1994. And I'll never forget, uh, he looked at me and he said, if you guys start a new group, I will give you the closing night at next year's ITG conference. And that was an incredible commitment. Why would he do that? You know? So that, along with some other um, encouraging people, and I've written quite a bit about some of the details of starting that group, um, we did it. We started a group. And so we worked our way to that full big concert at ITG, and, and your event in Chicago was one of those preparatory events. And that closing concert at ITG was absolutely one of the most special times in my career because a teacher of mine took a big chance. That's a, that's, that's a big chance. And, uh, the group was well received. I, I ran across the review of that concert the other day. And that's, that's one that just fills my heart with gratitude. Wow. Very cool. Good stuff. Well, I'll take a minute to uh, talk. I mentioned at the beginning that you are an author and, and I have a uh, side by side happens to be always close by in my studio i'm going to put this up on the on the stream there um obviously uh during covid maybe this was published is that right with right just as yeah it was completed the writing during the during the lockdown and then published the fall right after that that lockdown right yeah and you know i i, I personally don't know very many studio trumpet teachers that don't have this but this is not just for trumpet teachers this is for anybody who's trying to c cultivate a an atmosphere at your college where where you're free to fail where you're where you're um uh, you know you're free to be you and the, the fact that all, all the nuggets of wisdom throughout this book is just unbelievable and if you read it a second time you find things that you you, you didn't see before and so uh bravo whip on on this resource for for teachers and mentors and really i I mean, I think it crosses party lines as far as careers go and everything else, you know, I mean, it's just a, just a really great read. Uh, do, do you want to speak, speak about this a little bit? Yeah. And, and then this is Tony Plog again. Um, you know, I've always, I did the collaborative book and that's, that was just a, a kind of, I thought I should put a little workbook together for my students. And then we just started having so much fun practicing together. And that's, that's what some of my teachers did with me. I, I had a few crisis times, especially as the middle of my undergrad and, and it was tag team work with Ron Fox. You know, I studied with Ron for a year after being with Mike Ewald and it was that kind of, um, collaboration, you know, and just tossing things back and forth, like a good game of tennis or Frisbee or something else. He started getting me to play again. I was thinking, how do you play the trumpet? And he was just playing the trumpet. He did that with me. So uh, Tony came for quite a few visits to Baylor, particularly when his son was in school in Texas. And then he did a pretty much three or four day residency with us. And we just, he was starting his podcast pretty soon. And he had his blog going. And, and the whole thing started with, you know, I, I think we need to do a, a podcast about, yeah, trumpet collaborative stuff, but something about culture, because he was, I guess he was picking up on a certain vibe in the studio or in the brass area, the school of music, whatever. And, um, in our discussions, he went from a blog to a two part blog, to a podcast, to an article, to writing a book together. And then we started meeting with a friend of his, Ronald Kidd, who's just a wonderful guy and uh getting some advice and so that's what led to the book and it was tony's tony's idea i had always said the collaborative book was enough i would never write a real book i don't know if i would call this a real book it's a long <laughs> and um so what i did over the years you know you go to a clinic sometimes and especially on zoom sometimes that was awkward some of the, the classes on zoom with everybody muted so i would i would write chapter titles if an idea came up in a lesson or in a discussion, or I had an epiphany, 
or somebody said something like, that would be a good chapter title. I would just put it on a note in my phone called chapter titles. And during that visit with Tony, I showed him the, the titles and he said, that's, that's a book. That's going to be a book. So that's, that was where it started. And um, I was fortunate to get a summer sabbatical from Baylor to help fund it. And it took three summers to write it. And um, for as difficult as COVID was uh, during the, the early days of that, having that summer to uh, focus on, on the book, that third summer was really meaningful. And I have to say the timing was important too because, I mean, teaching the trumpet is important, but teaching is about relationships first, more than ever, more than ever. And you can't force those, but you can cultivate them. And you can, you know, I was, we were visiting with a friend who was talking about a young teacher frustrated about their students said, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. And the experienced teacher said, it's your job to make them thirsty. And I think that says it really well. I w I'd got to find out who, whose idea that was, but that is our job and we can't force relationship, but we can cultivate it. We can create opportunities for relationship uh, and, and, and wonderful fellowship. So this book was about that and getting back to the third summer, this was a per for me a particularly challenging summer um, because we lost Ryan Anthony, you know, uh, and I had played with Ryan the February right before the lockdown. Um, that was another special, that was one of the top moments of my life because Ryan was very sick and to see him dig deep right next to me, dig deep and play that s song of hope was just, it was an, a spiritual experience. So we lost Ryan and then uh, Stephen Goforth, the first, one of the first freshmen I ever taught, um, died tragically in an accident on his own property. And that was, that was a time for reflection. And then we lost Sally Tepper, of course, um, in the September right after school started. So during this time is when the book is coming to fruition. And I think that um, the timing was good because it just kept reminding me that we, we need to talk about teaching music, but we need to talk more about how we're going to do it and what kind of community. And you talked about being safe. You know, that's, a, that's an important thing. But I think sometimes people at least in my view, misunderstand what that means because safe can sound like a safe house where you're hiding, you know, where the doors are locked and you, you know, you, nobody's going to hurt you. And that's important. That kind of safety is important sometimes. But to me, a safe place is like a place to be brave where you can take chances, where you can, in your opinion, fail, but still be supported and and encouraged and uh, so i think that that was the motivation for the book and uh i just i'm grateful that it seems to be helping some people you know in the challenging times yeah just just a fabulous book and uh yeah if, if you haven't gotten it yet then uh get on it i'll have in the description below in this video how you can do that i, I assume it's just withfraud.com and go to a store there pretty pretty simple process um, while we're on with the author, I'm gonna. He had alluded to this a minute ago. Here's his collaborative practice concepts book, as well, and that you know, if takes some standard things like Clark and Arvin and sort of formats in, in a way where where you can team up to play through it. And I I use this a lot in in my teaching, and I think it's a it's a phenomenal resource as well. With do you have anything to to, to add to uh, to this book? Yeah, it's it's games. You know, uh, my, my, one of our trumpet partners, we have Mark Schubert, of course, team teaching the studio with me. And then Alex Parker's a wonderful colleague and trumpeter and studied at Eastman with Barbara and Charlie. And these are a fantastic jazz program, but you know, he keeps reminding the students, we get to play, we get to play the trumpet. And so this book was just a reflection of what sustained me through my most challenging times. And yeah, it's great to have, uh, you know, teachers that inspire us by their playing, but you know, the, t the deep part of teaching is that relationship and being, being willing to fall flat on your face in front of your students. And so Ron Fox kind of got me on this tag team thing. And it's, it's, uh, this is just an outgrowth of that, 
because those moments are what kept me, uh, kept my hope alive for a future in music. And after all, we're going to make most of our money and have our most meaningful experiences playing music with other people. And uh, we learn, you can learn tennis much more quickly <laughs> with the partner hitting the ball back at you than you can just slaving away in, in the practice room. And there's something to be said about that group practice, even to the point, like I've read uh, Richard White's book, you know, I'm Possible, and that's a book every, every musician should read. Anybody should read. It's just an incredible book. And he talks about, I believe when he was at Peabody and they had a tuba room, you know, I think they even had a microwave. Imagine that. <laughs> and, uh, and how they would all be practicing in the same space and practicing different things and how messy that would get. But on the other hand, I've been in sessions like that and you're always listening and observing and, and, and to the point where, how do you do that? How do you do, show me how you do that? And Rex Richardson was the same way on tour. Any one of us that did something, you mentioned the pedal C. Okay. Okay, Rip. How do you do that? <laughs> because he would never be satisfied till he could do something that somebody else had under, the, under their fingers or their mind or chops, whatever. So it's just, it's group stuff. It's, it's playing and, um, and it's just uh, a wonderful way to bring people together, you know, practicing together. Awesome. Yeah. Well, check that book out as well. And again, all of this will be in the description below. You can go to whiffrud.com. I think he has a store available there uh, with both of these books for sale. Excellent. Well, I have a bit of a nuts and bolts question for you. Um, on this channel, um, one of the things that that I like to talk about are audition strategies. And it's something that I'm particularly passionate about. In fact, I've worked with um, a couple of your students on military band auditions and that sort of thing. Um, what's your approach in coaching and preparing students for, for a big performance, a big recital or a big audition? Um, you know, can, can you talk us through that? What, what, what your, what your go-tos are there and, and how you approach that? And, you know, this is tailored for every, every student, you know, things have really moved along so dramatically in our business over the years. You know, I think about, and maybe they'll correct me if they see this, but I think about Tom Siders in Boston Symphony. I think about Tony Prisk playing in, in Philadelphia, he played in Houston for a while and others. And both those gentlemen studied with Ray Sasaki, either at Illinois or at UT. And, um, Ray taught musicianship. Ray's an amazing person, an amazing teacher. And he taught musicianship. And uh, he was not, in my view, wasn't teaching tests. He was teaching musicianship. That we get back to earn your way to the music, etudes, good techniques, good form, these kinds of things. Um, I believe Tom Siders didn't really learn excerpts till he got into Rice. How did he get into Rice? He was a musician. <laughs> and, uh, you know, studying there with Marie, and I think the Boston Symphony was probably one of his first auditions, and he's done so well there. Uh, Tony's done so well, so many others. And I think one of the things that uh, we have, that we face now is that, you know, if you want to be in a summer festival as a high schooler, you have to record some excerpts. And we hear lots of violinists saying, I wish I hadn't played the Mendelssohn when I was seven, you know, because it's hard to forget all the little things that we weren't ready for that piece, maybe even a young artist like that. So I think we have to look at each student, see what kind of baggage they might have with some of the demands of these auditions. Let's say if we're talking about, you know, orchestral or military band auditions. And I think that just getting back to the fundamentals and having a good regimen of of etudes, things that are the toolbox that are just prepping, 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 and then getting into the, the excerpts later. But sometimes, especially if they're high achieving, want to do things early on, they have to, to play the excerpts. I think the trumpet players over practice, you know, and if we have a good day, we think, oh, finally, I'm having a great day and uh, I can practice more. And then we overextend and then we have to watch the Chris Wilson YouTube 
thing on recovering quickly. <laughs> and actually, we had a warm up this morning because a lot of our students are doing. They have a symphony concert this week. They got the wind ensemble stuff, their quintet stuff, their jazz stuff, and they're playing these fraternity sorority shows with a big band in the pit every night. So this morning's warm up was all about what you were going through the other day. Let's just elicit a response and not force anything. But trumpet players over practice, and they think very often that practicing is making a sound. And again, I could be wrong, but what I understand of Hokan Hardenberger is when, especially in his younger years, is that he wouldn't play anything till he could sing it. It's a great exercise, and we do this once or twice a year in the studio, is to assign an etude and say, the first time that you play this on the trumpet will be in your lesson next week. But do everything you can to learn to learn the etude. And so that creates, okay, what can I do and not make a sound on the trumpet? other than air patterns or something. So it's just, you have to, we have to tailor it for each student and we have to um, get them to understand that we're going to be honest about the state of any particular excerpt or solo or whatever it is, but to, it's not uh, just to be able to talk business. I think sometimes it's hard, I know it's hard to separate how we feel about ourselves with how we're playing. You know, my wife will tell you if I'm getting let out of shape, or I haven't played a concert, or I'm not sounding good, I can get a little cranky. You know, I remember one time when we were fairly newly married, she said, so the trumpet playing is not going so well, huh? It's that obvious, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, you know, to just be able to, especially if you want to be a business musician, to start treating it like business and to keep the emotions at an appropriate level. And not to harshly evaluate your work. And, and I'm amazed sometimes when somebody plays something really beautifully in my studio, I'll say, that sounds great, doesn't it? And they're hesitant to agree. Now, why don't we, that's like, okay, I say, how many days did it take God to make the world, right? Six days. And what did he do on the seventh day? They might know that he rested, but he also said something. This is pretty good. This is pretty good. And I think that we need, we have to be honest, but if it's good, let's salute it and let's enjoy the fruits of our labor, you know? And if it's not so good, then let's, let's call it what it is. Appropriately needs work, whatever. But to, you know, we all know, hear all this, be kind to yourself, but, you know, self-talk is kind of a big deal. You know, we talk to ourselves more than anybody else, and we need to choose our words very, very carefully. And then to, um, you know, there are all kinds of strategies. Uh, I have three, uh, three students getting ready for some auditions coming up real soon, and I'm saying less and less. I don't want my voice... And I'm encouraging them not to get very much feedback the closer they get. They pretty much play the way they play now. I'm encouraging imagination, storytelling, not the feel. Certainly strategies for the day of the audition. You give great advice for that. Most people overplay in their first auditions. Do you have experience with that in your early auditions? Like overplay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. More than I would care to admit. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to, you know, it's like, and go to the auditions for business. Now, this sounds terrible, but this mindset, but, and part of it has to do with our personalities. I mean, I worked with a, a man who just was phenomenal in the orchestral field, and he's one of those that could walk in and literally said, you all can go home, this is my job, and then it would be his job. <laughs> I could never do that. But uh, I started having more success um, when I prepared well and then, tried not to care about the results. And things really got better for me when I when I would strive not to compare myself to anybody else. You know, that, that saying, comparison is the thief of joy. And we should be like our number one fans. Uh, another part of preparation that I have encouraged many students is to record, obviously, be recording all the time, have a playlist that you're constantly upgrading with your best takes. And that's what they should be listening to the week or two before the audition. They should be such a fan of how they play. 
be a fan of how you play, you know, and then you go in and say, this is how I play. And then the other thing is the perfectionism. All of my students grew up in the digital age, you know, and this illusion of perfectionism. And uh, I've heard several people say this, and I know it's the truth. You know, the American ideal, the American idea of perfectionism is digits, editing, editing photos, editing stories. We are, we present a perfect, our perfect little world. Well, you and I see these stories and we know some, some folks who are not nearly as happy as what is being presented. And the Greek ideal was the striving toward perfection, knowing you would never get there. And just knowing that that process of striving, uh, I did, Chris, you, you've won some jobs. Have you ever played a perfect round? No, but definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. Have you ever been surprised that you were offered a job after the way you played? Yeah, I've been, been surprised on an, on an advance. I've been surprised to off, get the job offered. Yeah. Yeah. That's always, you know, you just, you just never, and there's so much, so many things that are out so of much control. Of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I was helping a student with recording sessions um, in December, just running the machine and just an encouraging word. And um, when they finished, they were like, I said, well, let's just listen. Take a breath, walk around, put on the headphones and just imagine you're listening to somebody else. And they listened. And while they were listening, they are like, and I said, what did you think? And it was like, that was pretty good their own perception of what they had just done was so off. This is, this is this, this perfectionism that has just invaded our lives, you know? So I think that's, I think more than anything, it's just helping people realize that this is a good process. Hear the stories about people who take auditions. Some have taken 44, some have taken three. Right. Um, it's a, it's a process and it's business. And you have to treat it like, like a business. Uh, and then you demonstrate that you can check the boxes they're looking for and be a musician, turn a phrase. You know, there's nothing like turning a beautiful phrase to get a committee's attention. You know, we want to hear more of that. <laughs> yeah. Not all notes are created equal. And, uh, I remember taking a lesson with Charlie on auditions in particular, and he uses that X to mark the spot, you know, the, the phrase note, if you will. And, and that's, that's sort of stuck with me. I mean, you, you know, these, and I've been on the other side of the screen and, you know, you're listening to a hundred, 80, 90, a hundred candidates play Charlie A2 or whatever, whatever the case is. And, and if you're not setting your apart, it can be beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But you know, at the, on the other side of the screen, you, you know, it's just it can come across like that sounded like the last guy, or that sounded like the last girl, you know, you know. And so, so trying to find ways to be special there is kind of a key to that that process as well. Um, yeah, I loved, I loved everything that you said about you know audition prep for sure. Um, there's one thing in particular. And it's escaped me that I wanted to wanted to highlight, but yeah, that's that's great stuff. Um, you know, backing up to um, you know, like our favorite performances of all time. I just have to say that um, one of my greatest performances of all time was with you and and your teacher, Bill Fun, at, at the ITG conference. Uh, yeah, yeah, ten or twelve years ago, or whenever that was. Yeah, we did a just a a tribute to the past. We did our trumpet family trees and and you especially did a lot of research on that and we, we all got to perform together i think jim stevenson wrote us a piece um and uh, got to perform that together we did solo numbers and it was just kind of a really cool hanging out in bill fun's room you know there's just that whole project it's not really a performance necessarily although the performance was there it was the build-up and the lead-up to, to to the event and and the hang at the, at the conference and that's another thing that I was going to say about auditions as well. You know, you were talking about, you know, when you get to the audition, it, it, it should be a celebration. I mean, you know, the, the, the amount of work that you put in in that on that one little list or big list or however you want to characterize it, 
Um, the amount of growth that occurs on every one of those is, is worth celebrating and just getting up there and getting in your spot where you just want to show them who you are. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a reason to celebrate. And, uh, anyway, so th those, those two that's, things, that's, that's a great word. Yeah. That's a great really word for that. Really fun. And I sure didn't want to imply that we don't care. It's like, I don't know. It's like, uh, when we go to the national trumpet competition, I tell my students to please don't go to compete, go perform. The competition is the judges making decisions, this and that, but just go perform. Cause if in your mind, I wonder what they think, how's this going? How do I compare? Oh no, I missed that. Are they, you know, all that's chatter, but if you were performing, you you find flow mistakes you hardly never notice them you know you just you just are we're messengers we've prepared a gift we've wrapped it up beautifully here you go you know yeah. and uh, i think that's just so so important so we do care but i think it's like what do we care about yeah do, do we love the music do we love the performers that we're working with that kind of thing and when you take an audition you know love yourself and, and be selfish and be businesslike and be kind and um, good surprises can be around the corner. <laughs> Love those surprises. I've had those phone calls like, I can't believe I'm calling to tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Those are good days. It just takes one. It just takes one to build your entire career around. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been great stuff with, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know you're really busy and, and, uh, um, but so great to catch up and, and, uh, thanks again for, for, for everything. And, uh, do you have any closing thoughts, uh, before we shut this down? Wow. I just, if you're a, um, yeah, I would just say, you know, uh, evaluate in your own, you know, if you're listening to this or watching this, just evaluate in your own life, what music means to you. Um, if you have doubts about it, welcome to the club. Um, if you're a student and you're wondering why you're doing this, let me just say that, and Chris, I think you you, you can bear witness to this. Uh, I've taught a lot of students and not all of them are making their money in music. Um, the, the research is there, it's just not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. But I cannot, I have not found a former student yet who's in that situation, who has any regrets about diving head first into music. I can't find them. And if you're watching this and you want to get back to me, I'll start a list. But there's something about what we do, especially if we do it well with others and if we really pursue the artistry and the steps it takes to get to that, we are so well equipped for life. We are so well equipped for life. Why else would I have considered getting out of music at one point? You know, I'd been out of teaching for so long when I was going thinking about going back to it, when we got back together in Arkansas, I thought maybe I should do something else. Maybe I'm not qualified. But now I'm looking back, well, oh, I felt like I could do something else if I needed to. And I could have found a lot of joy in that. And I think it gets down to this idea that um, I like to say we're not defined by what we do. That's not a good way to live because I tried that. <laughs> that's, another, that's another story. But I think we're defined by how we do what we do, whatever that is. And that's how I would encourage everybody to do. It's just be first class in whatever you do. Great. Thanks so much, Whiff. This has been a beautiful. And, uh, and if you want to reach out to Whiff, WhiffRud.com, I think it probably is a good spot. Um, that's great. Put your contact in there and uh, check out his books um, if you haven't already. Thanks so much, Whip. Really, really appreciate it. A real pleasure. Yeah. Good times. Thank you, Chris.